Hello and welcome to Real Men Feel. I'm your host, Andy Grant. Real Men Feel is here to remind you that men are human and have the need, desire, and ability to express all of their emotions. I'm also a coach, author, and healer. You can learn more about such things at theandygrant.com. My guest today is Dr. Avram Weiss. Dr. Weiss is a psychotherapist, an award-winning author and teacher. His decade-long work on understanding the internal lives of men culminated with his recently published bestseller book, Hidden in Plain Sight, How Men's Fears of Women Shape Their Intimate Relationships. Dr. Weiss is a regular contributor to the Psychology Today website and offers workshops nationally about psychotherapy with men and helping men and women understand each other. He practices psychotherapy online from his home on an island in Midcoast, Maine, specializing in psychotherapy groups for men and psychotherapy consultation. Now, Avram was scheduled to be a guest last fall. I think it was October. And I believe there was a le- there was a legitimate power issue on one of our ends. It was a bad storm. So we had to postpone. Uh, we both thought the postponement would be a week or two, I, I imagine. Yeah. Uh, and then ended up being 10 months <laughs> due to my <laughs> withdrawal from life. So I want to start off by thanking you for your tremendous patience, sir. Happy to. You've come highly recommended. I'm glad to talk with you. I, I don't know if you noticed me smiling at your introduction because I thought, wow, what a world we live in that we have to start by stating the premise that men are human. We have to remind people that men are human. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, we really do. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, I'm not. I, I got it. But yeah. it's just like listening to you say it. I'm like, wow, what have we done? <laughs> So, so yeah, so so let's jump in. I, I really want to focus on your book, and and we talk about fears, and I've experienced fears plenty of times. So, yeah. is there a particular fear that men have of women, or is there a conglomeration of them? It's a conglom- conglomeration. That's a hard word, um, but I think that they are hierarchical. In that, I think the the fears that we know more about, that we recognize, and that men will actually acknowledge, are the, rest on deeper fears. So if you start near the top, I think the stuff people know about and would recognize would be things like men's fears of being dominated and controlled by women. And you can see that anywhere in the culture with all the jokes that we make about men being pussy whipped, men being who wears the pants in the family. Um, A lot of times I'll ask guys, I'll give them a scenario and I'll say, okay, your, your friends at work say to you, hey, we're going out for a beer afterwards. Why don't you join us? What's your first thought? And if they're honest, what they'll often say is, my first thought is, I wonder if my wife or girlfriend or partner, I wonder if she'll mind, which is crazy for two reasons. One is, shouldn't your first thought be, would I like to go have a beer with these guys? Mm. And second of all, in most cases, their partner has never said they mind. Mm. In fact, they may have actively, you know, like you don't have friends. Why don't you get out more? But it doesn't stop men from being worried that they're bad or wrong or they've done the wrong thing. So I I think that's the fear that is pretty recognizable for most people. It's funny. As you talk about that, I'm having like flashbacks to like bad sitcoms and to like, wow, do do sitcoms just perpetuate this nonsense? Like, oh, I better check with the wife and I'll be in trouble and all that sort of goofy maleness that that we're taught is how we really are. They do perpetuate it, but they also reflect it. Like those writers are trained to write things that people resonate with. And so if nobody ever thought that or felt that the show, you would never see the show. Gotcha. Now, have men always been afraid of women or is this more of a modern age issue? I think it's an always because I found something by a writer in 1840 something talking about men being handpacked. Um, And, and what, Yeah. So as far as I can tell, I think as long as there have been heterosexual couples, uh, well, I mean, I could be really silly and say, was was Adam afraid to say no to Eve? (laughs) She said, here, eat this apple. And he's like, oh, God told us not to. It's okay. It's okay." Yeah. (laughs) yeah, He's afraid to say no. Yeah. Did that first man fear his wife more than God? Like, I'll disappoint God, but I better not disappoint this woman in front of me. So this interview is already a big plus for me because I never thought about that before, but (laughs) I will now incorporate that. That's a great line. Was Adam more afraid of his wife than God? And even that feels like a joke or a twist that I've heard people say. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it starts there. And then when you get down to the deeper level, so the other sort of um, readily recognizable one is, is how afraid men are of any conflict with women. 
mm-hmm. and what enormous lengths they will go to to avoid conflict in any way. And typically what men do is they try to make the argument hyper-rational and they try to insist that their partner be sensible and rational. Why do men do that? I think because men are afraid of our own emotional expression, and so, which is why your show is your show. And so the way we manage it in relationships is we try to get women to be less emotional so that we'll feel less. Right. Because right. we're uncomfortable with what we feel. So if you would just calm down, then I could calm myself down. Right. Hmm. So are, are men afraid of being controlled, period, and conflict, period? Or is it really a different aspect when, when it's regarding a woman? It's a different aspect. It's a great question. It's a different aspect with women because if, if I get in a conflict with you and I don't like the way it's going, I'll just leave. I don't need you. If I get in a conflict with my partner, not only is there a dependency there, but it's an unacknowledged dependency, which is why men send such confusing messages. Because on one hand, so for example, how many times have you heard men complain about sexual frequency? My wife doesn't want to have sex with me. We don't have enough sex. It's pretty common. So if you say to a man, well, why don't you just masturbate? It, it, they don't even understand in themselves why that wouldn't work, that there's something beyond the orgasm that they're not even admitting to themselves. There's an emotional dependency, emotional connection. If it were just about a release, a physiological release, you could just masturbate. But that's not satisfactory. And I don't think men often understand why it's not. Did you go into this line of work and, and write this book because you have your own experiences? Are, 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 are you, have you been afraid of women? <laughs> well, my premise is that all straight men are. So it would be kind of ridiculous for me to say all straight men, except for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why you're the expert. <laughs> yeah. No, I, 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 um, I sort of understood this in myself as I sort of ha- looked at how long I had been unhappily married. Mm. Um, a marriage that started off great. And then over time, um, degraded and became much less satisfying to both of us. But clearly, I was terrified to say how unhappy I was. So, yes, personally. And then, you know, my primary teachers have been the men sitting in my office talking to me about this. And they just keep saying again and again and again. And then when I bring up in a group the idea that maybe this is about being afraid, the men just come alive yeah, because it explains so much for them. Was there a particular insight, aha, action that made you have your own, uh, I don't want to say breaking point, but realization of, of the, the level of fear you had? Well, um, I think I understood it in other people before I understood it myself. It was sort of retroactive for me. And as I listened to men consistently talk about all the things they were unhappy with in their marriages, and I would say sort of naively, well, have you talked to your partner about this? And they would look at me like that was the stupidest question that anybody had ever asked them. Like, no, I'm, of course I haven't talked to her. That's, that's why I'm here. And then it occurred to me like, well, it kind of sounds like you're afraid to talk to her. What is it you think would happen? if you would talk to her and then we start unpacking it from there. Hmm. Yeah, we are, we are bizarre beings. Um, Well, I think that, but I think that, you know, we were talking a little while ago about the layers of fears. And I think the bottom layer, the most profound that men are in largely in denial of is the fear of being abandoned. hmm. And, you know, men are taught to not need anyone, but we know we can see that men are afraid of being abandoned because in a heterosexual couple, when there's a breakup, who repartners first? Men. So if we don't need women, how come we're in such a hurry to get repartners? That's funny, yeah. So we're so afraid of abandonment that we won't speak up and raise any potential issue that could lead exactly. to abandonment. That's yeah. exactly what men say, mm. is that if I bring it up, it will make it worse. Yeah. I, I, I hear lots of guys say... Uh, you know, my, my partner expects me to be a mind reader and I'm supposed to just know everything they're thinking, but then they act the same way. And oh, right. I'm not going to raise the issue. They, sh- they sh- she'll just know, know this, right. or if, if it matters to her, she'll figure it out. That kind of, I've heard that a lot too. I, I work with one guy. I work with him for, I don't know, something like a year. 
And it, during the course of our work together, he filed for divorce, separated from his wife. And I can tell you that to this day, she has no idea of what he was unhappy about. He was literally had two young children. He was so terrified to talk to her that they are now divorced. And I pretty confident she has no idea why. It's amazing. Yeah. This, this question is based on something I experienced by, by doing this show. Do you find that, that saying men are afraid of anything, does that lead you to be seen as anti-man somehow? Oh, oh yeah. Oh. <laughs> Just a little. So, <laughs> so uh, I'll answer it in two ways. One is the sort of individual and the other is the larger. So an individual level, when you say to a man, I think you might be afraid of your partner. The reaction is so similar every time. It's almost comical. The first part of the reaction is this. They bow up. They get defend. I am afraid of nobody. You, you get that. But amazingly, it never lasts as long as a minute. Mm. Within a minute, you can just see the wheels starting to turn and guys going, you know, you know, that's an interesting idea. That that might explain a lot. And then in the culture at large, I have been attacked, interestingly, by both men and women. Uh, I've been attacked by and and I've been attacked by men in ways that literally frightened me. Mm. Um, so I've been attacked by men and called a feminazi and all kinds of stuff for suggesting any that men are afraid. Um, and then I've been attacked by women who think that I'm trying to rationalize bad behavior by men. Like I'm, I'm being more simple, just like the start of your show. I'm daring to say that men are human and we should try to understand them. And they're saying, no, men are wrong and behaving badly and we should just call them out. Hmm. And my response is, how is it, you know, unless you're planning on living on another continent where there are no men, how is it you think that this is ever going to get better if we don't also try to understand what's going on with men? Right. So what do you say to those bitter men that that will say, you know, all women are narcissists and they just, you know, use men, throw them away. We're treated horribly. Uh, they, they, maybe they want to be in that country that is free of all women. Uh, what do you say to guys like that? Well, you, you know, the whole MGTOW movement, the men going their own way. Yeah. So, yes, there are many men who have decided. I, I mean, what I try to do is I try to look past the anger and the implied violence at times. And I try to understand that this is an incredibly hurting human being that I'm talking to, that nobody gets that bitter without being really hurt. And that most of these guys have had some pretty traumatic experiences and relationships. They're not very connected to the part. They, they've tried to cut off the part of themselves that wants to be close to another human being. So that's the part I try to talk to. That's the part I try to reach out to is that you know, um, you, you're you're going to massage parlors three times a week. Is that, now, is that just about sex or that's just about maybe you want somebody to touch you, even a stranger? Um, that kind of conversation. Yeah, I did. a, I think I did three different shows on on MGTOW a few years ago. And <laughs> the way that I was able to talk to those guys, um, I found a common ground. We, we both wanted men to be happy. Yeah, we both wanted men to find peace. So I could they could. And it, it, it like I, I there was I was attacked a lot online, but then people that watch it were like, hey, this guy's trying at least. Like I'm like, right. yeah. So yeah. So I, I went from but I've been called, yeah, the feminazi. I've heard that one too. Like, like, oh then. Well, it's, unfortunately, like I mean, I think it's a problem we better address and we better start getting more real about because most of the people who are doing these mass shootings are these guys. Yeah. You know, they're the incels, the they're very angry, bitter, and violent. And so we can't just ignore them and um, act like they're not real. Do, do you find that, does fear come before anger? Well, I think anger often masks fear. So I think we're saying the same thing in the sense that anger is, um, if, you, if you think, if you imagine for a moment yourself being angry, you'll find your muscles contracting. So it's a more powerful position to feel angry. It's a more socially acceptable position for men to be angry than afraid. And so I think men are taught to, to sort of lead with anger as the emotion they're the most comfortable with. And so anger often covers sadness, fear, 
longing, all kinds of stuff comes out as anger in men. Right. Because that's more that's the acceptable mask we can yes. put on to hide yes. all those deeper. Again, right. the, 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 you talk one of the big fear, fear of emotionality, fear of abandonment. Right. So, yeah. And of course, it's enormously confusing to women because you're talking about saying that would seem to be tender but the person you're talking to is sounding angry so you're like i don't understand what you're angry about like what is going on here yeah. well, what are some of the repercussions of of men's fear of, of women there's a there's a researcher by the name of jim o'neill who wrote the introduction the foreword to my book who has um done or had colleagues do over 200 studies on what he calls gender role conflict. And I'll, I'll make the connection in a moment. So gender role conflict is the gap between who you believe yourself to be and who you believe society expects you to be as a man. And the more that gap, the more emotional problems you have, financial problems you have, physical, I mean, even things like um, high blood pressure, all kinds of things. And <laughs> O'Neill's work, suggests that the cause of gender role conflict are men's fears of women or is the underlying cause. And so the costs are, I think, I think men's fears of women are a big part of what caused what we're now calling deaths of despair in men, deaths from overdose, deaths from suicide. Um, you know, we know that loneliness is as big a health risk as smoking cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And I think that has a lot to do with these fears. Can men change, overcome, lessen these fears? Absolutely. Um, I, I That's a really important point to me. Um, so one of the things I insisted on the book, although I had mixed feelings about it, the last section of the book, there are three chapters, work for men to do, work for women to do, and work for men and women to do with each other in that order. And so one of my things I've learned in my experience is the first time I did a men's group, I remember distinctly that right before I'm ready to walk in the room for the first time, I thought, this is one of the worst ideas I've ever had. Uh, they're not going to talk. They, they're going to, you know, I'm going to be pulling teeth all night or they're going to talk about work or, you know, it'll be so sterile. The opposite is true. The groups I run with men's are the most devoted and committed and intimate groups I run. And what I've learned is that men are dying to talk to each other. It's women we're scared of, but men were dying to connect with each other. Yeah. And so I think what men can do, my idea is that it goes better when men start talking with each other before they try talking to women. And so the book has some pretty specific guidelines for men who want to connect with other men and talk about these issues there are some pretty specific steps for guys about how to find like-minded men, form a support group, and get together and start talking with each other. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, one of the – so I'm actually in training to uh, run men's groups with the Mankind Project right now, yeah. and I'm yeah. staffing a, a weekend for them next month in Massachusetts. And mm -hmm. are, are, are you familiar with their work? I am, and I've talked with them. They're a great uh -huh. group, and I think they're doing exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. Right, which is helping men to find each other and connect. Cool. Yeah, I just want to bring that up because now that the uh, I don't know, we're we're coming through the pandemic, I, I I'm tired of saying it's over and being wrong. But uh, as yeah. we're going through it, just I know I know that those in person groups are happening again uh, all over the country, all over the world. So that 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 is a resource for because I met lots of guys that claim, you know, like one one of the one of the things first resource I made with Raymond Field was a. a the a guide for adult men making new friends because yeah. a lot of guys they don't know where to go or how to start or you know i think they know. don't even i think it's actually even a little worse and then i think most men don't realize they don't have friends until something happens mm. so typically if you ask a man if he has friends they say yes but it's the follow-up question you need to ask which is no by friends i mean someone you actually talk to yeah. oh no i don't have those kind of friends yeah well it goes back to fear yeah, I don't want to admit um, if, if I fear being abandoned, how can I tell some stranger that I have no friends? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so it's usually either when people get divorced or retire for men that they look around and realize that if they the people they thought of were friends were their wife's friends. Yeah. Or friendships that were orchestrated by their wife, which women do so that they can see their women friends. 
because they know if the guys make at least some kind of connection, they'll spend more time together as couples. Mm. Yeah, that's powerful. And these are all like, why isn't this taught to us in like freshman year of high school? Like, go, go, you know, make a group. This this matters. And I know there's a, I, I can't remember who says it originally, but there, there's a song that male cells sing. And the presence of especially older men like teaches huh. just innately passes good things on and masculine role models. Interesting. Well, I, I live in a community where more of that happens than happens in the rest of the world because it's an island and uh, people have lived here for generations and they fish. So so typically grandfathers will take their grandsons fishing with them and teach them about things like hard work and honesty and accountability, you know, not in those words perhaps, but indeed older men are teaching younger men. But I think in the world at large, we've lost most of the ways, like who grows up with their grandfather anymore? You know, who even knows their grandfather more than superficially or who sees how many people have any idea what your, how many men or young men have any idea what your father does for work beyond the title do you know what he does during the day do you know what it feels like what it looks like what it's like for a man to be in the world of work during the day yeah. things like that yeah i mean beyond let alone grandfathers so many men don't know their fathers growing up right. so could right be, or, or live in very age segregated worlds mm. you know? so your your island is is proof that no man is an island there you go <laughs> But see, I, I have met there. Um, I mean, there it's it's the opposite. There are people in my community, people I know range in age from 30s to 90s. And how does that diversity help with with fear? I think it helps because um, growing up and growing old is, is not abstract. It's real. And you have role models of how men live in the world. And a question I've learned to ask people recently, which is an incredibly powerful and informative question is, I ask men and women, but different version for each, I ask men, what did your dad teach you about women? Not just in words, but in action. How did your dad behave toward your mom? And what did you learn about women from your dad? And for women, of course, what did you learn from your mom? And what women mostly tell me, which is very troubling, is the majority of women tell me that from their moms, they learned that men are not to be trusted, not to be counted on, don't expect to be close to a man, and figure out workarounds. It's horrible. <laughs> so when we see men who are who seem highly susceptible to feeling criticized you know men are very quick to think that women are criticizing them they are they're they've not been, making they've been it taught up. to yeah, yeah. it may right. not be overt and out loud but it's there yeah it might even be criticism from something they've learned from the person in front of them it's just the criticism they've been taught to repeat yeah yeah well i, I think what happens is that women get frustrated trying to connect with us mm. And so they get critical as an expression of that frustration. Yeah. Hmm. So you, you've kind of answered this with, with the mention of those last three chapters, but was, was hidden in plain sight how men's fears of women shape their intimate relationships? Who, who was it written for? I'm glad you asked because it is written for women as well as men. And in the workshops I'm doing with couples, I had a chance to do a workshop where we had a two-day workshop and then the same group of men and women had another two-day workshop four months apart. So I got to hear how the first two days impacted them. And the women had actually made more changes in their relationships than the men had. Mm. Because what the women said was, I have really thought that my husband was just being a jerk all these years. And I've been angry at him for years. Understanding what's going on with him, I feel much more sympathetic. I actually have a quote here from a woman in one of those workshops, which I think will say it clearly. Um, she said, I understand that my husband has not been ignoring, dismissing, or hurting me out of a lack of respect, as I have always suspected, but that he's scared. Scared to hurt me, 
scared to mess up with me, scared to not be enough. I had honestly never imagined he was scared and that I was so profoundly important to him that he was constantly terrified I would leave him. So the yeah. book is written for men and women. And what some couples are doing, which I really like, is they're reading the book together, a chapter at a time, and making time to talk with each other. And for the men, it's really helpful because they're basically saying, you know, yeah, like he said, you know, <laughs> they're not real skilled yet at expressing themselves, but they can say, yeah, chapter two, uh, that's me. Yeah, cool. Yeah, You gave me a question that I have to ask. What did your dad teach you about women? Oh, it's, I'm glad you're asking. Um, my parents had a very unhappy marriage. And so I think what my dad taught me about women, unfortunately, was that um, it, it doesn't get better. You can't talk to them. Um, there's not going to be a conversation. I think they sort of each stayed in their own orbits until they, thank God, finally separated. Um, but they were both profoundly unhappy and didn't know how to reach each other. And so I think the message was kind of one of despair and hopelessness. Yeah. Mm. Which you see a lot of. Yeah. How how long did it take you to free yourself from that lesson of despair? It took me most of my adult life. I would say it's in the within the last 10 years or so that I finally get it. Mm. Uh, aging helps, you know, when you sort of realize that the clock's ticking and you don't have forever. Oh. Uh, that's an interesting thought. So if you feel hopeless and despair, you find that the ticking clock can help break out of that. Or well, you, maybe you feel like you're wasting your time. I don't know. I, I don't, I don't have infinite time. So I'm going to, I'm not going to put up with this feeling anymore. I mean, do you ever wonder why if you watch football and you get to the last two minutes and all of a sudden the team that has not been able to move the ball all game, all of a sudden goes right down the field. It's the same team. Hmm. Well, something about it being the last two minutes loosens them up or something. But now they're like marching right down the field. And you're like, where the where was that the rest of the game? And I think life can be the same way when you sort of get to the at least the final quarter, at least if you're smart, you kind of look and say, oh, you know, I've been waiting all three quarters to run this play. I, either I run it now or <laughs> game's going to end. <laughs> yeah, and, and the game is not... Uh... How can I f feel the most fear for the longest time? That is not a, I mean, right. that, that is a game a lot of us play, but it's not what yeah. I recommend. <laughs> yeah, but at some point, are you are you willing to take a little bit of a chance? Are you willing to come out of those fears and say, well, <clears throat> here's what I want. You know, I don't ever talk about it, but here's what I ache for. Yeah, real men fear uh, could easily be what this show is actually called, but but yeah. I think even fewer guys would look for that title than yes. real men feel. But yes. uh yeah, and we are we are such a freaking collection of fears that we don't want to admit to, own, recognize, take a look at. So I really appreciate the, the work you're doing and, and bringing Thank some you. light to this. Thank you. I, I feel like it's important work. And, and I know it's important work because I've talked to hundreds of men. And again, I want to thank those men as the people who are my primary teachers, because that's who I've learned about this from. Yeah. Um, is they're telling me how important it is and what a difference it makes in their lives. Yeah. And one thing that's always struck me when I started realizing it, like so many men want to be seen as brave and courageous, but that requires fear. Yeah. So if right. I deny, well, I'm not afraid of anything, but I am brave and courageous. <laughs> well, they, that can't be. Right. <laughs> so people who are without fear in the face of danger are psychotic. <laughs> so... Intimacy, it's sane to be scared about intimacy because it is scary. It is vulnerable. It, it, is, it is exposed. So it's not crazy to be afraid. That's great. Huh. One other thing you said earlier um, about growing up and growing old, and I wanted to just come back because that, that you, you, you combine them. And in, in my experience, I find there's really a difference between growing up and growing old. So sure. I just I just want to ask what you thought of, of that. Well, I, growing up gives growing old gives you the potential to grow up. Okay. <laughs> but so, so they're not synonyms then. Right. No, okay. if they okay. were, it'd be a lot better world. <laughs> um, 
But, you know, it has a lot to do with who you hang out with. Um, all of us, we're, you know, we're tribal animals and we watch other people and we, um, we look for things that we think are working for them. So I've been watching long-term happily married couples for a long time. And I, and I watch very carefully. And I don't just mean in my office. I mean, anywhere I am in life. And I try to understand, I try to see what is it that's working for them. They've been together 30, 40, 50 years. They seem quite happy with each other. And, you know, it's a very, it's a very simple, not profound answer I've come up with. They're nice to each other. Mm. You can see that when they start to get to a point of contention, that they don't, they don't bear their teeth. They're considerate. They're thoughtful. They're, they're gentle makes a big difference yeah yeah i mean a, a simple you know just just be kind can be yeah, the simplest exactly. rule of life and and to yourself as well that's not just outward kindness yeah that would change. yeah yeah so I, I'm, I'm, i'll step on some political toes here but i have a t-shirt that i love that says make america kind again yeah yeah indeed uh, yeah i wish someone would run on such a platform yeah um i remember what's the what's the best way for people to learn more about you see all the things that you're up to Best way is to go to AvramWeissPhD.com, A-V-R-U-M-W-E-I-S-S-P-H-D.com, and you will find a link to the mailing list there. And if you sign up for the mailing list, you will get a free ebook called uh, Life Lessons Learned, which is some of, the, some of my favorite columns that I've written online. Awesome. And then you'll be on the mailing list and you'll get. And what I'm doing now is I'm looking for communities that want to bring me there as a speaker, workshop leader, whether it's your church or the Lions Club or whoever, because I'm doing these workshops, helping men and women understand each other. And so you can email me at that link, the Avram Weiss PhD, if you're interested in having me come to your community. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I hope if you get a... a a long lasting international tour. Uh, Cause yeah, this, this is stuff that everybody needs to hear and understand and, and ideally change as well, not just live with those fears. Yeah. I mean, it's sad to me. One of the things I do in the workshops is I I'll give a scenario that couples often experience and I'll ask the men to write down on a postcard. What are you thinking in this scenario? And I asked the women to write down a postcard. What do you think? And then I'll read some of the postcards to the audience. And of course, the men have absolutely no idea. Everything they would guess that the women are thinking is the opposite. <laughs> They're wrong. And the women are completely wrong about it. And it's like, you, you, you live in the same house. You eat every meal. Now you eat every meal together. You sleep in the same bed. And it's amazing how little you know about each other. Yeah. It reminds me of the, uh, the old, uh, the newlywed game. Yeah, but but it never ended. They didn't learn exactly. anything more, even no yes. matter how long they're married. Oh. That's actually a great reference point. Yeah, mm. cool. So I think so, we want more with each other. I think you know, underneath the fears, we yearn to be closer. Yeah. Maybe that's maybe that's the answer. But is is there one thing that you wish more men knew? Ooh, I like that question. Um, I wish more men knew that women want the same things they do, that they knew not to think about women as somehow like an opponent, but understood that the person sitting across from them, while they think about things differently and feel differently, in the end, they want the same things you do. Yeah. And that they're not trying to criticize you or put you down. They're trying to connect with you, trying to get closer to you. Yeah, it makes sense. Like if if guys communicate by busting each other's balls and being jokey and sarcastic, well, then women think, oh, that that's how I that's how I get to get into this. Then, so yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Well, Avram, uh, thanks for thank you for your ten months of patience. Um, yeah. I believe this conversation was well worth the wait. Uh, I, I, I love everything that you were up to, everything you've thank shared you. with us. And, and I mentioned to you before we started, but yeah, um, come back anytime you have the desire. Um, I will. And I encourage everyone to check out the website, check out the book. It's good stuff. Uh, so thanks for joining us, Avram. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Uh, wherever you're discovering Real Men Feel, please subscribe, follow, like, do whatever the thing is on the platform that you're doing this thing on. Uh, you can always write to me at realmenfeel at gmail.com. Always glad to hear from you. And until next time, be kind to yourself. <laughs> there you go. Thanks, everybody. <clears throat>